Welcome to NYLA 2020 On Demand. This session was previously recorded for the NYLA 2020 virtual conference. It is available to you through December 31st, 2020. Please note, once viewed, each on-demand program is eligible for one continuing education credit. Links to materials and presenter contact information have been archived in a Google folder and are made available after conference. Support files and documents can be found in session files below the program description. Any questions about the NYLA 2020 virtual conference digital platform can be directed to Christina at NYLA.org or you can call 800-252-6952. Serving New Immigrants Beyond the Basics is sponsored by ESRT and co-sponsored by SCLA, SSRT, YSS, and ULU. Without further ado, our presenters. Hello, my name is Indira Mukherjee. I am a children's librarian at um, Queen's Public Library. Over Hello, everyone. My name is Adriana Blancarte Hayward. I'm manager of outreach services at the New York Public Library. Thank you for being here today. Hello, um, my name is Indira Mukherjee. I'm a children's librarian at Children's Library Discovery Center of Queen's Public Library. I'm presenting um, Serving New Immigrants Beyond the Basics with my um, co-host Adriana from New York Public Library. S serving New Immigrants, Queens is the most diverse community in the country. We speak more than 800 languages in Queens according to ELA. Uh, before I start, I just want to make uh, give you the art, uh, outline of what I'm going to present is bilingual story time. As you can see, book clubs in uh, different languages, South Jamaica Reads, our New American programs, what programs they are providing, our JBA, what uh, services they are providing, in our unique ESOL classes, and Typerary. And then I'm going to present um, three slides from um, my friends uh, at Brentwood Public Library. <clears throat> Actually, Queens is very diverse in, in the country. Every city speaks different language. If you go to Flushing, it's a huge Chinese speaking community. If you go to Jamaica, where a huge population that speaks Bengal, Bilingual Story Time, it's a very popular program at our Children's Library Discovery Center of Queens Public Library. A lot of libraries provide bilingual story time, but what makes our different uh, from others is it educates both sides. Not only Bengali speaking patrons learn English, but English speaking patrons also get a chance to learn Bengali. Salma Islam, who provides this program, what she does, she writes the Bengali pronunciation in English letters besides translation, kind of like the same way we have it in the dictionary. So at the end of the class, other language speakers also learn a couple of Bengali words, which in a way it's a little unique. If you check our Queen's Public uh, Library's Facebook page now, because of um, after co during COVID, we started a lot of um, online programs. You would see lots of bilingual story time programs for kids in Chinese, Bengali, French, Russian, Spanish, Korean. Some of them are done by our children librarians, and some of them are done by storytelling professionals. Probably lots of libraries provide other language book clubs same as us, like we do in Flushing, we do um, book club in Chinese, depending on the neighborhood, our different branches provide Spanish, Russian, Korean book club as well. But what makes this Bengali book club is uh, different because it's, it's it done in our um, Hollis branch and it's for the adults in Bengali, this book club. What makes this different is Sometimes they invite the authors or community leaders to join the book club as a speaker or guest, or just simply discuss the book. 
when people see someone influential from their community, they feel comfortable and enthusiastic about the program. So I have some um, pictures from those programs, but remember, these are all pre-pandemic programs, what we provided. South Jamaica Reads. Queen's Public Library is part of a literacy initiative called South Jamaica Reads together with seven other partner organizations to re raise the literacy in South Jamaica, which was really, really very low according to New York City Public School reports before this new initiative was taken. Jamaica Reads hired Bengali and Spanish speaking tutors who went one-on-one -on -one with the students in the schools to improve their literacy level after most of it uh, were after school programs. Trust, confidence, knowledge, and building relationships are the most important keys to serve any community. Building trust with the commu immigrant community, it's very important. Once you gain the trust, that will boost up their confidence in you. They would feel comfortable to use our services to take advantage of. As you can see from these slides, it's this, um, I have the data from before the initiative was taken and after. And you can see the, from the slides that the reading level, it, this was for third graders, the reading level went up from 2013, 5% to 2018, 47% for PS40. And then 48 and one uh, 160 they went up to uh, 14 to 49 percent and then 25 to 42 percent so you see how it is it went up so much actually knowing the culture is another key issue while setting up i would say while setting up the program any program or service that we provide it's always good to check with someone who already know the community uh, better than we do because sometimes it happens we set up a program and no one shows up it is because we don't know the community well so if you are in contact with somebody or build up your relation with somebody from the community who can guide you better about the time and days to provide the programs then more people will join the program and will be benefited from that program and also it, is, it would be very grateful, great help if we have them work as a volunteer in the library, if it is possible. Going behind the scene to solve the issue, especially for immigrants, it's another key to reach out to the community. Here, I would like to share a story that um, one of the uh, li one of the principal of this one of these three schools i don't remember exactly which school was it the principal of the school noticed that students were not coming to the school on thursdays and fridays the principal went little deeper and spoke to the parents and found out that the problem was the uniform it was a huge new immigration immigrant population who had some restriction on washing the clothes every day and every other day. So generally, weekend was their washing days. So therefore, the parents felt, felt comfortable sending their kids up until Wednesdays. However, by Thursday, the clothes were dirty and parents felt embarrassed to send their kids with unwashed clothes. <coughs> that was the reason for the kids absence in the school on thursdays and fridays so what the principal did he went ahead and bought a washing machine to <clears throat> make the community feel comfortable and the absence of the school in the school went really down so now i'm not suggesting every library is to go ahead and buy the washing machine but going behind the scene to solve the problem it's very helpful to the immigrant community our new american program <clears throat> we provide um, esl classes computer classes 
coping skill workshops as well. <clears throat> we provided, actually thousands of people lost their jobs during pandemic. So we provided 80 virtual program sessions in four different languages, in Spanish, Chinese, Bengali, and Korean. And the total attendance was 1,088 people. <clears throat> Actually, NAP provided a lot of different um, remote workshops on applying for unemployment benefits, resume writing, computer literacy as well. So it's it was a great help, I think, to the immigrant community. Then our cultural art program provided by our NAP, we offered 16 program sessions targeting Spanish, Chinese, Bangladeshi, Korean ethnic groups and English speaking audience as well. So, and the total attendance was 360. Same way, in partnership with New York Legal Assistant Group, and International Rescue Committee, our NAP provided uh, some workshops of six sessions, and uh, you can see 113 people attended. Now, our uh, Job and Business Academy, in uh, collaboration with New, New Women New Yorkers, they offered lead programs where um, we, these programs were done in before um, pandemic. So uh, we offered like eight interactive workshops at our Jackson Heights Library, where immigrant women got a chance to learn and practice resume writing, networking, job interviewing, uh, US workplace culture, public speaking, teamwork, and a lot more. And now during pandemic, our JBA is offering a lot of different programs like basic video editing, which is more important now because of everything went uh, virtual. So it's going to be a great help to basically all community, not only immigrant community, but it's very helpful for everybody. Introduction to Google Drive is another one. Civil Service 101 information session is another one and innovative business models. All these are our virtual programs. Our English for Work, that program, it's like um, to act, actually, it helps customers build their language skills, which they actually need for, to have a successful career, I would say. So participants will not only, uh, they would learn how to write a resume and the cover letter, but also some interview techniques or comfortable communicate, communication, uh, how to learn um, in interview and on the job, and then they will um, be able to make uh, some suggestions and communication, communicate better with the supervisors and peers, and some workplace technology, how what to use, and they would even help you um, preparing like presentation and reports as well. And we do have ESOL for healthcare where not only they learn English language, how to do this, but it's with healthcare vocabulary. And then for technology careers, ESOL, that provides that uh, emphasis on the tech sector vocabulary as well. And we have um, English conversation group, which is not available now due to pandemic, but we do have these uh, programs, um, any, some of the branches they offer, where people can just go and um, they, they don't need any registration, where people can just go and join the program and have a discussion with um, media, with a librarian or among the group itself. And um, so this is a very popular program. This was actually before pandemic. So hopefully we will go back to uh, this when everything goes well, normal. Now, we have a wonderful program, it's called Tibrary, where we provide uh, new immigrants, especially the men, if they do not have a tie for the interview, they can borrow it from the library for free. And on the, I have a picture of the, how the box look like, and on the top, it even gives you the 
interview tips, what to do and what not to do. So I think that's very helpful, especially for the immigrant population. Other services we provide um, from Queen's Library is IDNYC. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but it helps immigrants people um, to, um, you know, get a New York City ID. Culture Pass, you can visit culture, cultural institutions free for your, with your library card. This is a great, great help to our immigrant community. Queen's Memory Project, it's like a team collaborates with community members to collect personal histories, images, and other records of life in the borough of Queens. These materials get a permanent home in the library's digital archives. We have a lot of multicultural uh, heritage program. We have Sunday concert at Central, where a bands of every variety perform uh, at uh, Sunday concerts at Central. They offered exposure to music from diverse cultures. And we have um, tax sales voter registration census 2020. And now we do have uh, online homework help. H homework help is a huge um, demanding program. Uh, they, uh, among the immigrant uh, population, because of uh, pandemic, we can't do it in person, but we do have online. So through brain fuse, which we just started. Now, my friend, um, I have a little contribution at um, Brentwood Public Library where um, they are offering and um, some programs which they think that goes beyond basic, and they were um, they actually shared that information um, here as well. So they what they did. <coughs> Five hours pre-licensing driving course, it's in Spanish. So what they actually did, they contacted around like say about six of them, something like that, six probably. Uh, at the beginning of the year, they um, contacted driving schools in Brentwood and to uh, find out. And only one offered classes in Spanish. So which is um, precision driving school. And what they did in order for the school to do the teaching off-site, the school had to submit a form through the DMV to obtain permission to teach at the library that went through Albany. After that, an inspector came to the library to make sure the room was appropriate to host classes there. And they did, decided that the maximum class size can be 36 students. Then uh, the children's librarian, Ms. Uh, Emily Kay, she offers uh, snacks around the world. Uh, this is a wonderful program where um, this is very popular among the uh, teenagers and um, where uh, kids explore snacks from one country, from different countries actually, different ethnicity. Uh, both like salt and salty, they learn some interesting facts about the destination. They start when they started, they brought um, started getting some snacks from Amazon, but it became so popular that uh, they had um, uh, to collaborate with their local businesses. For example, when they had she had the program um, Italy, um, the country and um, Italian heritage. She had lasagna catered from Italian local restaurant. And then she had another program uh, chicken uh, where she got chicken suvalaki from a Greek restaurant. So what happens is every, um, in every session actually, after trying all the snacks, she actually made a um, evaluation of all the snacks for the kids to rate and kids actually had fun. But now, you know, during pandemic, um, you can do this program uh, this way. So I have a picture of what it used to be and now what it's happening now. So um, 
what used to be you can see on the top two um, pictures and the bottom now they're making the boxes where they have uh, like snacks from different uh, countries or and except of course on tortilla and with a menu act and act activity package so kids who register for this program they would come and pick up the box and then um, on the virtual program day they would open the box and they will do the same thing what they used to do in the library when it was um, a library program in person now the next program she does is the k-pop club which is um, as you can see before pandemic it was like the way the picture is it's like where they actually listen to uh, some Korean pop music, they played games, they made a themed craft, uh, but now during pandemic things have changed. So now they are, since they are not open to public, uh, I mean for the programs, so now they are making the boxes, as you can see, the boxes are ready where they're offering like a Korean snack, maybe a random goodies like keychains, stickers, things like that. And, um, and uh, the instruction of the craft. So that's how they get it ready. And with the registered uh, patrons, they come. And again, it's very popular uh, among the teenagers. So they come, they register, they come, they pick up their box. And then on Discord, every week they meet where they watch like music videos and play games. And that's when they open this. And what she also includes is like some um, writing system in Korean and some simple phrases in Korean. And at the end of the class, she has a, a quiz kind of where you can write the names, um, your name in, you know, learning those uh, um, simple phrases or writing uh, the language a little bit. And then um, that's how she does. And while doing all of these programs, we noticed that there are some uh, hindrances, like uh, language is the main issue, digital divide, which is like a really concerning issue now, and lack of technology skills. And um, of course, uh, to overcome this, we need to provide more literacy workshop, especially for the parents who do not speak English or the adults who do not speak in English, um, everybody actually. And we have uh, some uh, read along books available for kids to borrow in the library. And um, uh, we have like self-learning database uh, where kids can um, use it and the parents, if they don't speak the language, they don't have to be ashamed of so that they can, uh, the read along will help them, their kids to learn. And um, of course, technology classes providing, not just uh, providing basic computer classes, but now is the time I think we should uh, include like how to use laptop or tablets or how to use our databases in public libraries. Those are the programs I think we should include. <clears throat> and also hotspots like uh, for digital divide, uh, it's Queens Library uh, provides hotspots uh, where kids can borrow the hotspots um, and they can keep it for the rest of the school year and then come back at the end of the school year and they return it. So I think this is a great help. Before I finish, I just want to thank Ms. Emily Kay, the children's librarian at Brentwood, and Ms. Adabel Campos from the programming librarian at Brentwood for their information. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Now I'm going to hand it uh, over to Adriano, um, my, my co-host who is from New York Public Library. Hello everyone, my name is Adriana Blancarte Hayward. I'm excited to be here with you today talking about serving new immigrants beyond the basics. 
Um, as I said, my name is Adriana Blancard de Hayward. I'm manager of Outreach Services of the New York Public Library. Feel free to reach out if you have any comments. Um, current past president of the Reform and Ortiz chapter and also a former past president of the New York Library Association Ethnic Services Roundtable. And I'm very excited to be part of this panel today with Indira. Uh, I'm going to start with giving you a little overview of the, the work we've been done at the New York Public Library. So for now, for 125 years, um, this is our anniversary this year, the New York Public Library has welcomed New Yorkers from all walks of life. We were founded in 1895 and NYPL is the nation's largest public library system. We have 88 branch libraries in our, throughout our neighborhoods and also four scholarly research centers. So we're able to provide and bring together people and opportunities for all. The library celebrates the rich multicultural diversity that builds New York City as we are also serving um, New York City. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, NYPL actually covers three of the five boroughs of New York City. Indira previously presented about Queens Public Library, who serves Queens, but we cover the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Um, there is about 8.4 million people in New York City, and 37% of those were born outside of the United States. There is foreign-born population living in all the five boroughs of the city, and the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island serves about a third of the city's immigrant population. So I want to start by talking about the theme of our presentation. And what do we mean by basics? And then I think that's something that can be very subjective. Basic can mean different things to different organizations, right? So for example, at the New York Public Library, we have offered what we can consider for us, traditional library services for a very long time. For example, we've had collections in languages other than English for many, many years now. Um, we have working, we've working with schools for many years. We offer multicultural programs. And as you can see for the image there, we also have offered English as a second language classes for many years. The poster that I'm showing is uh, from an English class held at our Tompkins Square Library uh, in Hungarian, and this is from 1920. These are some other pictures from our digital collection from the early 1900s, where you can see we were serving immigrants back then as well. The picture on the left is a librarian's assistant telling a story to a group of Russian children in their native language. And the picture on the right shows a Sunday school after school visit to our Chatham Square branch in Chinatown um, with some, a group of Chinese students. But one thing stays constant, the belief and the fact that libraries are for everyone and the libraries are trusted spaces. They are for the community and with the community and that we aim to be welcoming to all. What do we offer? throughout the years, we offer information, we offer resources, and we offer programs. As times have changed, so have the services, even though many of those seem pretty similar to what I mentioned before. We offer still books and resources and e-resources now in English and many languages. We continue to offer programs, educational, informational, and cultural. English classes continue to be one of the most sought out and needed uh, programs that we have. At the same time, we continue to go with the times and now we offer computers and free Wi-Fi for everyone, as well as resources for all ages and family. The images here show, um, on the top is a group of our ESOL students a couple of years ago now um, taking a class. On the top right, we have some bookmarks that we made just last year promoting that libraries are for everyone in four different languages, in Spanish, Russian, French, and Chinese. And at the bottom, you can see a teen class learning about using uh, technology in a laptop. So what are some of the programs that we offer that we can consider beyond the basics? And these are all pre-pandemic. Um, we, of course, as I mentioned, offer ESOL, English for Speakers of Other Languages. We also offer language conversation groups where people can come and practice English and other languages. We offer a myriad of programs 
related to computer and technology skills in English and other languages as well through our Tech Connect program. Uh, the lead program that Indira mentioned, which is through New Women New Yorkers, we actually have been working with them since 2015 when they started. And it's a great program that offers leadership development and opportunity for immigrant women. We offer immigrant writing workshops. We offer family literacy workshops like the, the Victor shows there um, in English and other languages as well. We also offer multilingual story time. At the same time, we also offer programs related to work and life skills development, as well as cultural and recreational presentation. And we participate in heritage celebrations such as Immigrant Heritage Week, which is a New York City um, holiday, and also Immigrant Heritage Month, which is a national holiday. And of course, our multilingual collections are crucial to what we offer our immigrant communities. Other examples of Beyond the Basics pre-pandemic is um, the services that we offer through partnerships. We have citizenship preparation and legal initiatives such as the NY Citizenship, which this was a tri effort, tri meaning New York Public Library, Queens Public Library, and Brooklyn Public Library, that we were able to host an attorney that will help people individually to fill out their naturalization form to help them in the past to become citizens. This program just ended um, this past June and is going to start again in a new ambition with a new name um, starting next year. We also have a partnership through Immigrant Justice Corps who helps people with immigration legal help. They host two fellows at our locations and they're supervised by an attorney that help people with many different situations. Some have DACA questions, some have TPS, citizenship, you name it, they're able to offer help. Um, I believe this also is available at Queens Library and Brooklyn Libraries. Um, we offer citizenship application assistant workshops, again, helping people working with community partners to get through that path. And we offer citizenship study preparation through classes and also through study groups for that our staff leads to help people prepare and practice. Um, a picture that you see there is uh, one of our New Americans Corners. This is an initiative that we started back in 2016. It's also a tri initiative that is with the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, um, working with USCIS, the federal government as well, where each of the New York City library branches have one of these corners. They may look a little different. They may vary in size, uh, but the intention is that people know there is this space where they can find information and resources uh, for immigration matters, but also we strongly encourage our staff to use these corners to promote programs that might be of interest to immigrant communities as well. Other community services and resources that we offer, we uh, our libraries host two IDNYC sites. IDNYC is a municipal ID uh, that was that is given by New York City that allows people to get a form of identification. And the only requirement is that you are a resident of New York City. We also pre-pandemic hosted community fairs when we invited community organizations to come to our branches, set up tables. We made a big event out of this so people can come to the library and learn about all the resources available in their community in English and in other languages as well. Um, we assist with voter registration and of course, census support, so crucial for everything we do. And some of the past programs that we have held that I think can fit in the Beyond the Basics category. I'm going to tell you a little bit about these pictures. The one in the top left corner is a presentation of dancing for the Bangladesh, Bangladeshi community and our Parkchester Library in the Bronx. It was a lecture with some videos. It was very well received. In the center, we have a group of ESOL students, which they develop with the library staff that is right there in the middle, an exhibit, a photography exhibit. And um, one of them is a professional photographer and they did interviews about each individual person, which was very interesting to see and it was very well received. There was a reception. 
This is um, in one of our lower Manhattan branches. The one on the top right corner is a program that we had in another one of our libraries on Staten Island, the South Beach Library. We they hosted a program inviting people to come and learn from other cultures and countries. You can see they have uh, books to be borrowed, but at the same time, they purchase candy from all over the world. So people love coming in and learning and getting free candy. The one in the bottom to the left, it's a musical performance in our sewer park branch in Manhattan, the Lower East Side. And then on the bottom right, we have a program that was actually uh, through outreach our library staff there working with the YMCA ESOL students hosted a craft program for them. This is in our Castle Hill Library in the Bronx. So now that we're all going through the pandemic, how do we move what we do to continue to help and serve our communities and of course our immigrant communities as well? So something that we did at NYPL is we started we established a multilingual resource group, which is composed of volunteer staff members that help the library proof reading or doing short translations of our communications so we can communicate all this information that seems to change so rapidly. So they are aware of you know where what we're doing as a library, but also how things are changing otherwise. Um, the sign that you see on the right, this is when we move to our phase two, the, this, the grab and go service that I will go over it a little bit more in the next slide. Um, we made sure that our signage was relevant to each of the neighborhoods that the libraries were in. The one that is listed there has information in English and Chinese. Because as Indira mentioned, New York City is so diverse that each of our libraries, I think of them as like our own, own little world is like very different communities. So we try to address the needs by providing programming and collection. And of course, in these times now, information and translation available in the different languages that are needed. Um, other ways that we have transition or programs is we offer online book discussions. Um, we have some that are held in other languages besides English. We have some in Chinese, uh, Korean, and in Spanish. We also have virtual learning conversations for people to come and practice. We have them in Spanish, we have them in Chinese, Japanese, and French. And we also have moved our story time online. There is a channel that hosts a multilingual story time. The ones that I picture there is a bilingual Arabic story time. We have a bilingual Hebrew story time and a Japanese story time as well. We also have some um, in Spanish and bilingual English Spanish as well. In addition, we have contributed a lot of multilingual blogging. That is one of the ways that we can make sure that people still feel connected to our collections, to our programs and to what we are doing. On the pictures, you can see a screenshot of our World Languages multilingual blog channel. And you can see a post in Chinese about the online Chinese book discussion titles discussed in September. There is a post in Russian, letting people know about new acquisitions in the collection. There is information on where to study English online in Chinese. And then there is a book list in Spanish, letting people know about new titles that were acquired. We also expanded our ebook collections, our multilingual ebook collections through our Simply and Overdrive offerings, being that for a while people were not able to place holes in our physical books. We wanted to make sure they still had access to resources and books. And many of our celebrations that we used to hold in person at the branches, we needed to transfer online. And how did we do this? We built um, our online presence through our website. The links that I list here, feel free to visit, visit them afterwards. Um, it's a way, if you go there, each of those links have information about the holiday that we are celebrating. We also have a list of the programs that we did, where we also include book lists, we include blogs on resources, so people can still feel celebrated and seen now online. And the advantage of this as well is that 
this can be shared through social media, through email, through many different channels that people can still participate and be part of the celebrations. So, as I mentioned before, with the multilingual resource group, we want to make sure that we're being inclusive and we offer information for all. Um, you can see on the right is um, one of the blogs that we created, making sure we have information in the languages that are most prevalent for us in New York City and in the boroughs that we serve. Uh, one is um, telling people how they can get a library card, a digital library card to our Simply eApp, which is an e-reader, but at the same time allows people to get free virtual digital library cards what, while they're not able to get them in person. And we made sure that was translated. Besides in English, we have it in Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Bengali. I know we also have it in Japanese and I believe we're working in Arabic and Italian at the moment. And also um, when we move to our phase one um, of our service model right now, uh, we have what we call the grab and go service, which is a contactless checkout and return service where patrons can put books on hold, receive their materials and return materials in a way that is safe and secure. And when, when that became available, we make sure to translate that information in all the languages that I mentioned before as well. In the right, you can see screenshots of some short multimedia videos that we created. We wanted to make sure that whatever was created in English, we also had it in these languages. So our branch staff can share them for their communities to their social media pages like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, also, what we're doing right now, um, our ESL classes are moving online, have moved online. There was a successful pilot that was held over the summer to transition safely to an online environment because something that is very important for the library is people's privacy and information. So through this pilot, there was an opportunity to train the instructors, but also an opportunity to uh, teach people not only English but also digital literacy and what does it mean privacy, what does it mean to have your camera on, your microphone on, how they can join these classes in a secure way, for example, like making sure they're in a, in a space of their location that they're joining that no one else will walk behind them or that they can turn their camera on or off, you know, without restrictions. So that was a pilot that was held in the summer that went well, and now upcoming in the fall, uh, more classes will be offered. We are also transitioning now into offering our multicultural programs into this virtual environment. Um, I'm sharing here two of the programs that we are hosting or just hosted for Hispanic Heritage Month. The one on the right, um, we were able to host an author talk in Spanish um, with someone that writes about cooking and has written cookbooks and is also a blogger because we have two of our branches that are very into having a book discussion that centers around cookbooks and food and you know how food brings people together so this was a great conversation that happened recently and um, the other program that i'm adding here as an example is a panel that we're hosting soon um, again for hispanic heritage month we call this one latinx and libros and we invited five different panelists, two of those being some of our librarians, to talk about challenges and successes in the world of books. This has been a learning experience for all of us, moving our programs online. Um, the one, the cookbook author, that one we held on Google Meet, the panel we're gonna held over Zoom. So we are learning as we're moving along as well. So that was my way of showing you how we have been helping patrons before pandemic and currently and what is basic and what is not. But something I want to leave you all with a few reminders. As I started with my presentation, just keep in mind that basic or beyond the basic can be different for everyone. It depends on where you are at your library at the moment and whatever you do to build those connections with your immigrant community, support them, offer resources, it's great.
one basic first step is to find out who the immigrants in your community are. And that you can do through many ways. You can perhaps look online statistics. You can look around your neighborhood and see who is there. I always recommend, you know, in a safe manner now, taking a walk around and seeing who your little stores are, um, who are the people that are using your laundromats, what are the churches or religious services that are in your neighborhood. That's a way to find out who the immigrants in your community are. And then some general tips that might be helpful for everyone is making sure you display welcome signs, library activities and materials information in the language that's spoken in your community, as I mentioned before. And of course, now, depending on you are in your reopening process, make sure those transition to the online environment as well. Of course, provide library application forms and orientation materials in your library users' native languages. Even before, but now even more, utilize the online platforms that you have available, as, so that your website, perhaps you have blogs as well, social media, and this is a way to promote your programs, your services, and your collections. And something understanding whenever possible is great if you can hire bilingual library staff that can represent your community. If not, you can always count in recruiting bilingual volunteers. Some, sometimes some of your library patrons are very eager to help out as well and they can offer support. But something that I want to mention, and this is something I believe is, and I call it here, no language, no problem. Friendly attitude tops language skill. And I think so, that's very true. If you uh, make an effort to help people, to be approachable and, you know, try to communicate in some way, that is most important. That's someone that is fluent in the language, but it's not very helpful. And a tool just to throw here, uh, Google Translate, I know it's not perfect, but it has improved a lot and it offers you the opportunity to do beyond the traditional typing or inputting via text. You can also um, use it to do handwritten characters, which are most needed for some of the languages that our communities speak. And also you can speak or input by sound. So with that, I want to thank you all again for taking a moment to watch this webinar and we hope this is helpful to you. Uh, feel free to reach out to either Indira or myself if you have any questions or comments. We hope the information presented is useful to you. Thank you, everyone, and be safe. Thank you so much, both Indira and Adriana. This concludes the NILA 2020 On Demand program, Serving New Immigrants Beyond the Basics. We hope you continue to take advantage of all the on demand and live programs the NILA 2020 annual virtual conference has to offer. Thank you for helping us make this the best virtual conference ever. <laughs>